Okay, thanks, uh, Anders, for the talk. Uh, I'll introduce our final speaker of the workshop, uh, Dr. Marcel uh, Bowman. So Marcel is a, a tenure track assistant professor. So I did a very recent one at MPI uh, Security Pri Privacy Center. He's also head the software security research group. So earlier, uh, Marcel, I guess, uh, spent some time in Asia, in Singapore. He did his PhD from the National University of Singapore in US, and then went to Australia, Monash University as a, uh, as a lecturer and then senior lecturer. So Marcel uh, is very well known for his, he's very passionate and also very well known for his work on fuzzing. And also, I mean, he's a very strong advocate for reproducible research. And I think his work is uh, already very impactful, already went to, for example, use industry at Google, the first bench. And so Marcel, welcome back to Europe, uh, Europe and looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chen Dong. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Um, so what I, so this is gonna be the last talk of the workshop. And what I hope, uh, what I wanna do is, I, I don't wanna be too technical, but at the same time, um, say something where you can learn something. So what my objective uh, is for this uh, talk is to um, confuse you a little and uh, hopefully you learn something and then hopefully at the end of the talk, most of the confusions are resolved. So the title of my talk is on the surprising efficiency and exponential cost of fuzzing. So how can something be surprisingly efficient and at the same time come at an exponential cost? <clears throat> um, so, um, before I start with the uh, technical matter, um, just a, a quick question is, are you using the Chrome browser? And if you use uh, the Chrome browser, then it's very likely that uh, your um, daily life is impacted by the tools that I that are developed in my group. Um, so their fuzzers are used at a very large scale, even at the scale of the Chrome browser. Um, and uh, one of the tools that I developed called Entropic is used uh, in the huge uh, compile, uh, huge fuzzing infrastructure that is developed at Google that they use to test your software. So if you're not using Google, at least you're somehow impacted by the tools that I developed because uh, many open source projects um, that uh, facilitate encryption, compression, streaming on the internet uh, upon which uh, most of the internet is built is also being fast by the tools that uh, we developed. Um, so what what I'm what I'm doing is I I have, I have uh, two streams of work in my in my group. One is concerned with uh, fuzzing for automated vulnerability discovery. So previously, I was talking when I talked about my PhD. Always said uh, I do automated bug finding, but these days. Um, I'm, fi I'm finding automated, I'm finding vulnerabilities because um, security flaws are much more impactful and much more um, um, useful to like costly to, uh, to everyone. So in particular, I'm interested in uh, finding all the bugs, which is effectiveness, finding the most bugs with the limited budget that you have, limited resources that you have, which is efficiency. And what happens if you increase the resources that you have to the bug finding, bug finding capability of your um, automatic vulnerability discovery tool. Um, and my, the second part of my group is interested in the foundations of software security. So we've heard a couple of talks here on providing guarantees and software security is uh, technique like verification. But these kind of guarantees always come with an assumption like uh, that the compiler actually compiles the program uh, for which we have proven properties into the right binary. That, that, that was the first talk that we heard uh, in the workshop by uh, Deepak uh, yesterday. But also things like what happens if your machine doesn't execute the code reliably, what happens to your properties? Um, can we give uh, some kind of guarantees that we test the software system? Um, many people would say, no, I'm going to talk about this as well. Foundations of software security. So here I wanna start with um, a small program. And that program takes four characters like a string and it would crash for the string bad exclamation mark. And so uh, you have uh, technically um, two prevalent forms of testing. 
One is called testing such a program. One is called white box fuzzing, and the other one is called black box fuzzing. So white box fuzzing is often implemented using a tool or technique called symbolic execution. I think some of you will be familiar with this, where you essentially look at the source code of the program and then construct so-called path constraints. Um, so here you could uh, have a path constraint that would go to the left of the first branch, B. So the first character is not a B. You have another path constraint where the first character is a B, but the second character is not an A. And so you construct this uh, symbolic execution tree in that way. And after generating five inputs, after exploring all the five paths, you would see that there is a crash. So that's white box fuzzing. And it's most effective. And why is it most effective? Because it can find all the bugs. In principle, uh, it can prove the absence of, of a bug here, in this case, the reachability of that abort statement, simply by enumerating all the paths in your program. Of course, we are again making some assumptions. Um, but in principle, symbolic execution can, prove, can prove the absence of bugs. So it's also quite efficient, right? So you only need to generate five inputs in the process that I just explained. But if you just select each path uniformly at random without replacement, on the average, you would find this bug using only three inputs. Okay. So now black box fuzzing on the, hand, on the other hand is very, very simple. The only thing that you need to know is that the program has an input space. The program takes inputs. And for some of those inputs, it will crash. And so our black box fuzzer here uh, will just uh, assign a random value to each of these parameters. And the range of these values can be one out of 256 values because character in, in C has uh, 256 values. So of course, everyone knows it can never prove the absence of errors. Right? If you just generate test cases and test cases and more test cases randomly, we can't really prove the absence of errors. So here, uh, that's a very famous quote from Edgar Jekstra saying, program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show the absence. So here's small anecdote for, um, for this time. I think um, Jake Stra was very passionate about his, um, about his research and he found the publication uh, process here, peer review, too slow. So he wrote these structured notes on programming and then distributed them among, among his colleagues. These days, I guess he would be uh, tweeting and um, writing blog posts about his ideas. Um, yeah, these were the times back in 1969. So, um, so now we can actually uh, say that this is not entirely true. We can at least say something about the correctness of the program. If you look at this problem from a statistical point of view, we can at least estimate some kind of residual risk. So we have made some recent progress in this. Estimate the probability that the next input that you generate um, exposes a crash or exposes a bug. So, okay, now we have these two techniques. One is called white box fuzzing, which on the average would detect the bug after three inputs generated. If it would choose each path uniformly at random, uh, uniformly at random, but without replacement. So you would enumerate all five paths. On the average, it would discover it in three in using three inputs. And this black box fuzzer that I just described would require four billion inputs, which is quite a lot. So then you would say, in this case, white box fuzzing is better, right? So wrong, uh, at least not always. So here is, um, um, so this example that I just gave was of course a pathological example. We could enumerate all paths and it wouldn't take much time. But uh, people even in 1984, and here this is an excerpt of a paper published in 1990, found that this way of testing where you enumerate what they call partitions and what we call paths, um, is doesn't really inspire confidence when we compare it to random testing. So here, uh, Hamlet and Taylor write, Hamlet corroborates this result using a different sampling model. He shows random testing to be, a, to be superior to white box fuzzing and its superiority increasing with more paths and with the program confidence required. So um, somehow the empirical evidence didn't seem to support this idea that 
enumerating uh, everything, uh, all the paths is really a bit superior to just randomly doing things. So, and the key insight is that just randomly um, executing program inputs, generating program inputs and executing them on your program uh, is super fast. So on, on my machine, generating 4 billion inputs um, takes about 6.3 seconds. And if I had 100, 100 machines, it would take 63 milliseconds. Remember, uh, randomly generating things is uh, embarrass embarrassingly parallel. So um, you, you can do that really quickly if, it, if you have just enough resources. Unlike symbol execution, which requires some communication overhead, of course. So, the, but doesn't really matter whether this particular example is reasonable or not. Uh, what the main insight here is that if your white box fuzzer takes too long per input, our black box fuzzer will outperform. And so there's a maximum time per test input. Okay. Sorry, that's. Uh... So let's look at this probabilistically. Um, we will build a very simple model, make as very few assumptions in that model. The assumption that, that I make is that I just model the perfect uh, white box fuzzer. Uh, we have what we call an error based partition where each um, input in the partition reveals a bug, or uh, all inputs in the partition do not reveal a bug. So you have this kind of partitioning. We have red and green kind of partitions, could be corresponding to paths like in the earlier example. That doesn't, there don't need to be only two uh, partitions, there can be many partitions. And as we already saw in that example, the most effective testing technique samples from these error based partitions. If you just enumerate all of these partitions, we would um, prove the absence of bugs if there's no, if there's really no red partition. We do not know whether a partition is error revealing or not. And we do not know uh, where these red partitions are, how many there are, how this partitioning, how this partitioning is actually um, concretely done for a certain program. We do not matter. That's, it does not matter. We do not care. And then we say that the testing technique samples a program's input space and discovers partitions uh, when the partition is sampled for the first time. So here is uh, one of the problems in testing. We want, to so, we want to show that a program works correctly for at least X percent of its inputs. We call this achieving confidence. <clears throat> and so um, we have two techniques, uh, black box fuzzing and white box fuzzing. Now the black box fuzzers just simply, simply samples the input space at random. And of course, some partitions at random um, uh, with replacement. So we can sample the same input twice. It doesn't really matter. Some partitions uh, will be sampled several times and others will not, at all, will not be sampled at all. But because there's no analysis, we just say it takes one unit of time. On the other hand, we have a white box fuzzing, which we model as the perfect testing technique, which samples each um, input systematically and samples each input exactly once. Each, sorry, samples each partition exactly once. The partition is chosen uniformly at random uh, without replacement. So we can essentially enumerate all partitions. That's what the white box fuzzing can do. But uh, it takes some time C because of its program, additional program analysis effort, some constraint solving, and so on. We say it takes C units of time to generate one test input. So white box fuzzing uh, on the average will that will exhibit like a linear increase in the degree of confidence achieved uh, over time. And in fact, it will achieve 100% confidence. It will prove the absence of errors after enumerating all K partitions. Um, black box fuzzing, on the other hand, of course, because it's random, will discover the big partitions in the beginning and then just randomly flatten out. And it will never reach 100%, as we know. But we're not interested in achieving 100% confidence. We are given a certain degree of confidence x. So this is where both techniques achieve this degree of confidence. And here we are assuming that the white box fuzzer only takes one unit of time. So what happens if we increase this one, one unit of time? Of course, the slope increases. So increasing this time it takes to generate one test input for the white box fuzzer increases the time to achieve the same degree of confidence. So there's some kind of maximum bound on the time per input uh, after which black box fuzzing wins. 
right? So, and we computed that uh, bound. And it's a very simple bound, which is only depending on the given degree, on, uh, degree of confidence. So I don't want to explain just how I derived this bound or what it means, but maybe give you an interpretation of that bound. Suppose your random, like your black box fuzzer takes only one millisecond to assemble one test input, which is too much anyway. But if you want to establish the program works correctly for 90% of its inputs, the white box fuzzer must take less than 4.1 milliseconds to sample one test input. Otherwise, your black box fuzzer wins. So maybe 90% is not enough. Maybe you want to be more, you want to show more, have a higher degree of confidence, 99.9%. Um, you still, uh, this, the white box fuzzer still require, must still take less than 370 milliseconds per test input to um, achieve, uh, to win uh, over, over the black box fuzzer. And this holds for all programs, it doesn't really matter which program, and for the worst case partitioning. And so our insight here is that even the most effective fuzzing technique, which is effective because it can prove the absence of error, is less efficient than a black box fuzzer if generating a test takes just relatively too long. And this sheds some light on the 40-year-old riddle and demonstrates the fundamental limitation of black box fuzzing. Yes. Yeah, sorry, let me quickly ask a, a question because I, I think I missed something important. So you said repeatedly, that white box fuzzing can prove the absence of errors. So are you yeah. assuming loop-free programs or are you only interested in bounded execution somehow or where does the statement come from? Right, so we have, uh, our model is, we have what we call error-based partitions. There's there are finitely many, boundedly many uh, partitions and each of these partitions can be either error revealing or not. So, and then the systematic technique uh, enumerates these partitions. For example, each partition uh, at random, but uh, uh, without replacement. So you would essentially have a finite number of, like you have K partitions, it would require the, the semantic technique, the white box fuzzer only K, like, okay, very concretely, in that example, we had five paths. The support execution tool would have to generate at most five inputs for each one input per path to find the bug. But if you have an input dependent loop, you have infinitely many paths. That's why I don't understand why you can enumerate them all. Yeah, the assumption is that there are infinitely many partitions. There can be arbitrarily many, yeah, but there must be finite. finite okay, uh, thank you. Okay. So, um, so if you have sufficiently many uh, machines, um, to, in order to maximize executions per second, um, the black box fuzzer is the best that we can get, right? And here's again, uh, the answer is wrong. Uh, what I talked about was, it's called a good generation of black box fuzzer. It would generate inputs from scratch. But what you could simply do is mutate a given input. So suppose we have a mutation of black box fuzzer that mutates a random character in a seed. And so we start our fuzzing procedure with a seed called bad question mark. So here an expectation, uh, it would choose uh, the question mark with probability one over four, and then choose the right exclamation mark, the right character with prob probability one over 256. And it gives us an expectation about 1000 inputs if we start from bad. But of course I cheated here a little bit because we should start from a, from a seed that, uh, that's very close to the seed that we need, to the input that we need. So, so the idea of gray box fuzzing is to essentially discover this seed along the way. And the only heuristic that we use is that we add generated inputs to the corpus that increase coverage. So if you walk through that, uh, if you walk through that example, suppose we start with a, some arbitrary seed. Um, the, the next seed, that would increase coverage would be one input that starts with the letter B. And as we saw with this example of the question mark turning into a exclamation mark, it would take about 1000 inputs to generate that seed. So we add that seed, that input to, to the seed corpus. And now we choose a seed from that corpus, again, uniformly at random and see 
uh, and then hopefully generate um, an input that starts with the letter, with the letter B and has uh, A as the second character. That was, would be the next coverage increasing C. And an expectation we would require about 2000 inputs. And so we can go on and add all the seeds that increase coverage to our seed corpus. In the total, we go down from 4 billion inputs to only 10,000 inputs to discover this, um, this bug. And on my machine, it takes about 150 microseconds. And uh, one contribution of a work that we published at CCS16 was not only to see this connection between query box fuzzing and symbol execution, but query box fuzzing kind of simulates this enumeration a little bit, but also to boost uh, the group fuzzer by choosing these seeds smartly and therefore um, choosing seeds that exercise so called low probability paths, we get down from 10,000 to another 4,000 by simply choosing the seeds wisely. Okay, awesome. Uh, now we have a really efficient fuzzer. Um, let's throw more machines at the problem. So earlier I said, if I executed that program, fast set program on 100 machines, it would take 63 milliseconds. So then you might think X times more machines means finding X times more bugs, right? And the answer is of course <laughs> wrong. Otherwise I wouldn't ask that question. Um, so here's an, here's an insight and this, that's an empirical insight. And we also have some kind of probabilistic explanation but there's no probabilistic proof because these formulas are really difficult to, <laughs> to make proofs on. Um, so we just looked at a lot of um, fuzzing data that we've collected over the years for CPU years worth of data on like 300 open source projects. And we looked at six measures of code coverage and just had a look at what happens if you increase the number of machines to uh, whatever measure we have, like this the number of vulnerabilities found. And all of this is, uh, uh, we have an open, open science and reproducibility policy in our group. So uh, all of this is of course reduced and can be looked at and tried. So we, what is a num, what is a machine? So what we do is we don't actually have 256 machines. We scale the data. We simply assume that uh, um, the number of inputs that the fuzzer generates, uh, uh, that one fuzzer generates per machine. Um, so twice the machines can generate twice the inputs, no synchronization overhead. And what we find is on the right, that's what I said, what I told, told you earlier. If I increase the number of machines exponentially, the time to find the same bug kind of decreases exponentially as well. So with uh, um, one on one machine, it takes six hours to find, find a bug. On 32 machines, about 10 minutes. But on the left-hand side, we see what happens when we increase the number of machines exponentially. We kind of see almost linear increase in the number of additional bugs found within the same time budget. So how, how is that? How, why is there an exponential cost in, in uh, finding more vulnerabilities? So we didn't only observe this for vulnerabilities, we also observed it for different kinds of coverage criteria and number of crashing campaigns and so on. And across um, many subjects, and so here the observation is that uh, given the same non-deterministic fuzzer, discovering linearly more what we call species, we need an abstraction for things that we can discover. Uh, within the same time budget requires exponentially more inputs per minute or exponentially more machines. Okay, so, so let me confuse you one more time. Uh, so if, Marcel, could I interrupt? Just ask a quick sure. question, right? So, I mean, of course, if you, let's say you have a hundred machines, different machines, if each machine is clever enough to explore a different input space, you should certainly be able to find more bugs, right? A hundred times like more bugs. So you're making some assumptions here. So we are taking the same fuzzer, which can do exactly the same thing. It could just, I mean, we're, we are, um, we are just scaling what a fuzzer can do anyway across many machines. And we are taking away even the cost for synchronization. So if you say, 
well, let's let's have 100 fuzzers and all of these 100 fuzzers work in different parts of the input space. Uh, that's fine, but that one fuzzer can also work in all parts of the input space just as well, if it just executes much faster, like 100 times faster. Mm -hmm. Right, but if you can partition the input space into like a hundred disjoint parts, right? Each one parser is exploring like one of the disjoint parts. You can certainly find more bugs that way. Yeah, to me, conceptually, there's no difference between sampling. Suppose you have a certain sp space that you sample uniformly. Let's just uh, assume that there's uniform sampling mm -hmm. right. and partitioning that space into 100 partitions. Mm -hmm. And then sampling all, all of these partitions uniformly. Okay. But somehow, I mean, if you just run the same fuzzer on a hundred different machines, right? You're just exploring very similar input space repeatedly, right? That's the. Or maybe there's just something I, I'm not uh, following. So. Um, so again, like a normal fuzzer would also repeatedly explore the same input space. Whatever strategy you have uh, in the parallel world, you can also have in the uni like in the single fuzzer world. If you just assume that the single fuzzer executes a, a lot faster, like exponentially faster, like like you just switch out the the machine under the same fuzzer, and the machine can suddenly execute instead of one input per second. It can execute two inputs per second or uh, four, eight, 16 inputs per second. Okay. Yeah, Maybe but, we but, can, but, yeah, we can discuss yeah, we'll, later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, what, um, okay, let's look at one security flaw. Uh, each of these um, facets. Uh, corresponds to one security flaw. And again, we have the x-axis increase exponentially from one to 1,024, and the, the y-axis is linear. And so some of the errors, like uh, as you see uh, at the top, will, as you increase the number of machines exponentially, always be discovered. So there's a 100% probability that you discover this within a given time budget. And some of those errors will never be discovered. It doesn't matter how many machines you have within the given time budget. Maybe there's some, uh, maybe at some later point, but not within this uh, within this plot. Um, down in the second row, you see almost like a sigmoid uh, kind of increase, like in the beginning, for a few number of machines, uh, it, the probability raises only a little bit, and then later. Uh, what, do you, what I draw there in the middle is it's called the expected number of machines where you discover this back. It's about, so, so that's uh, what we call an inflection point. And, uh, and so we see these kind of almost sigmoid structures um, for other errors as well and for other um, single things like uh, statements or branches. And so here we simulated this. We, you can imagine like you have uh, an urn with, uh, with uh, balls of two colors, black balls and white balls. And now you wanna, you give uh, each of these proportions. So you have, um, um, you give most of the balls are black and some very, very small proportion is black, this is white. And then you can essentially simulate what happens if I, if I increase the number of machines exponentially. What is the probability that a ball that is discovered within a given time bound is um, is uh, is white, for instance? And what we find is that um, the uh, what we, what we see on the left hand side is uh, again the the uh, the x axis is um, exponential number of machines it's on a log scale. The y axis on for the left hand side is on the on the linear scale. On the right hand side, we see a log scale as, again. And so this, there's a certain uh, inflection point. And what we do, what we did here is we kind of fitted a, an exponential curve between the origin, which is one machine and the inflection point. And we, should, we can see that an exponential curve goes slower than our discovery probability, which means between the origin and the inflection point, we see exponential growth 
of course we can't the probability can be greater than one and that's why there's an inflection point so what does it mean for a non deterministic fuzzer so the probability to expose a specific vulnerability specific known vulnerability um, within a given time budget increases approximately linearly with the number of machines okay Linear increase in the number of machines gives you a linear increase in the probability to expose a specific vulnerability or program statement or by the program assertion. Uh, of course, the set doesn't need to be one. You can have, uh, we can also look at the probability to expose all vulnerabilities. And again, exponential amount in many machines, exponential increase probability between origin and inflection point. Huh. So how do we get from this, what it looks like in, a linear increase to this from this linear cost to this exponential cost. And so on the left hand side, we see the total number of species, which is like one buck or one statement. And we, we again see the sigmoid structure there. But we can, of course, increase um, the number of um, vulnerabilities that we have in our program uh, 100 or 1000. And so, why, how do we get from the left hand side, which is the sigmoid shape? To the right hand side. Um, the reason is that we are totaling um, these probabilities for this individual species. And for the time where they are essentially, the, the number of machines that we have has increased them exponentially um, before they're expected to be found, they look like almost on the linear scale, they look like almost um, flat increase. So that's what we see there. And then once they are found, like an expectation, they're also again flat. And so they, 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 these uh, parts of the curve don't really matter. But these, these parts of the curve matter. So, and this is what essentially aggregates. And I want to give you the intuition. Of course, there's some formal discussion in the paper, but that, that's essentially the intuition. We are adding up these, what looks like an, a linear increase. Um, and that's how um, we go from a, a, a linear cost to an exponential cost. So intuitively, each new vulnerability requires some more resources than the previous vulnerability that we find. So the takeaway here is a constant rate of vulnerability discovery requires an exponential amount of resources. Okay, so what I, what I talked about is um, white box fuzzing, which is the most effective technique if we assume that we can enumerate all the paths, then we can find all the bugs, right? Of course, you must make this assumption, but that's white box fuzzing is like the most effective technique. But on the other hand, we have this uh, black box fuzzing, which doesn't have all, any of this machinery, but it's super fast, right? And this is how it, there is some time where even a dumb technique like black box fuzzing can outperform a very smart technique like white box fuzzing. And this time is, it seems to be, at least in practice, to be very critical. Many people that try to modify gearbox fuzzers these days very carefully trade this um, uh, execution per second against some smartness uh, in, the, in the testing um, technique. And the third thing I talked about was gearbox fuzzing, which is some kind of enumeration, and this is only in quotes, um, by using a very lightweight feedback structure, feedback signal. And then I talked about the exponential cost of vulnerability discovery. Um, so if you want to take a deeper dive, I have vacancies in my group. There's PhDs and postdocs at MPI. You can also read up on an interactive te textbook called The Fuzzing Book. And we have, if you're starting on fuzzing, we have a, like a perspective article where we looked at challenges and reflections for fuzzing. Thank you so much. Happy to take questions. Hey, Felix, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the talk. I'm just wondering about the specific definition of white box fuzzing. Is this really equals symbolic execution or do you categorize other methods under white box fuzzing too? So, um, so white box fuzzing generally is, you look at the source code and, um, and generate test cases by looking at the source code. And I think by symbolic execution, I actually mean concordic execution. So you actually need to generate inputs. 
uh, because then we can talk about time for input. Um, so the difference between white box fuzzing and black box fuzzing is really that you consider your program as a white box or a black box. Yeah, okay, thanks. And maybe one other uh, part of the answer is, I'm assuming in this particular in this, um, efficiency analysis, I'm trying to assume the most effective technique um, and, and the most, like the dumbest technique. And then I would hope that most of the actual testing things are somewhere on the spectrum between these two techniques. Mm. So um, I mean, my, my question was mostly motivated by me wondering whether your claims scale to verification. And, uh, but I guess they don't give, because I was wondering how you actually time uh, inputs um, per second in a verification technique, but I think, yeah, the way you clarified it makes little sense. Martin? Hey, yes, uh, thanks for the talk. I, uh, I had a question, which is more of a high level question maybe, but uh, one thing I'm wondering about is, uh, if you imagine you have a, like a really good white box fuzzer, uh, and then you, you have a set of programs and then you, okay, use this white box fuzzer. And then you, um, I mean, ultimately the white box fuzzer is gonna generate some inputs that trigger the issue by exploring paths and whatnot. Uh, and then the question is, can you actually use these white box fuzzers as oracles uh, in order to teach a black box fuzzer to imitate them? So I'm not, uh expert in machine learning, but um, so this, this sounds like an adversarial uh, scenario where you essentially have the teacher being the white box fuzzer and the black box fuzzer is like a machine learner. So the white box fuzzer, it just generates, you know, imagine you have lots of programs and you run this expensive white box fuzzer. So run, 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 generates lots of interesting inputs that, um, you know, that, that uh, trigger the bugs. And then when you have a black box fuzzer, you can use this, you know, these learnings from the white box fuzzer to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to generate, uh, to generate inputs. So, um, we even explore in this, um, uh, we had a journal extension to that and we explore a hybrid technique that integrates black box fuzzing and white box fuzzing. So how they talk is, um, you can talk about, you can talk via, uh, the symbolic execution tree. So you simply look at, um, the inputs that are generated by the black box fuzzer and then mark these parts of the symbolic execution tree as already exercised and essentially focus the white box fuzzer on parts that are not exercised. And, um, and the other way is uh, in practice, what, how these two talk is via, um, via the seed corpus. So if you have a mutation of black box fuzzer, you uh, have a seed corpus which uh, you can share between these two techniques and then modify the exit. For instance, in white box fuzzing, you would then uh, execute some ex execute the given inputs and then modify these executions. Hmm. Yeah, I was thinking more like you would have a generative model over the inputs uh, learned from the white box fuzzer and then you would sample from the generative process when you're doing the black box. So what yeah. we tried uh, some time back was, uh, so my, my little experience with machine learning is uh, generative machine learning particularly was we wanted to, to learn to generate valid inputs. So the problem in fuzzing is that most random inputs are not PDF files, for instance, if you test a PDF reader or some yeah, kind yeah. of, so how can you kind of learn this? How can, can you look at um, the response from the program uh, to see uh, to learn, use the program as a teacher and learn whether an input is um, valid or not, and then essentially maximize the probability that the generated inputs are valid. So that's can, that can be done, but so my, in this limited experience, uh, we learned that um, the machine learner is not very fast. So that, that's what we require for black box fuzzing, right? We can't, what we currently have is like 100,000 executions per second. That's uh, not something which we see uh, like a machine learner to achieve like this kind of rate of, so, so this particular project didn't take off just because 
most of the inputs that were generated didn't, you know, were most of the time not, not valid inputs. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, sampling should be fast, but okay. Um, okay. Yes. Thanks. I'll just. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? No. So one thing to maybe to follow up on what Martin was asking, there's some work from a student journalist group at Columbia and they have used machine learning to make some predictions and then make further more efficient. I forgot the name of the tool. I news. think it's new, what's a new fuzz or new news? Rest, yeah, news, something yeah. like that, yes. Yeah. Right, so yeah, so one, uh, maybe I have a, Martin, do you still have a question? No, 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 sorry, I have to. Oh, okay, Good. yeah. So Marcel, I was wondering still about the last part that you were talking about. I was wondering, is there some connection of this to the coupon collectors problem? Where yeah. suppose you have like N coupons and uh, you want to like see how many times, so I guess you pick a random coupon from the back, right? And then you then put it back and how many trials you have to do to make sure that you have collected all N coupons. Is that some, somewhat related to the, to the last part you talked about? Yeah, absolutely. Coupon collector, collector's problem was something which came up when I did this probabilistic analysis of the efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're, the problem is, uh, as you mentioned, the to collect all. So the, the the problem is to collect all the coupons and how much time do you need to collect all the coupons? Coupons in a, right. uh, like in the, in boxes of cereals or something like that. Mm -hmm. And this, um, um, if, uh, an answer related to the harmonic numbers. So yeah, it can be used for the analysis. So recent thing that I've been really interested in doing is um, estimating the, uh, so a, a problem that we have in, um, in software testing is we have, we wanna achieve coverage, 100% coverage or like 100% mutations killed or something like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, 100% is not achievable because some things are just not reachable. Uh, some statements cannot be reached. Uh, but we don't even know whether, uh, we can't statically tell whether how much coverage can be achieved. Why? Because that would be the verification problem. If we could tell whether the statement could be reached, then we could simply cast any verification problem as a, sorry, any reachability problem as a verification problem. Mm -hmm. So we, can, we can't statically know how much can be reached, but maybe we can estimate that. and. Um, estimate how much coverage can be achieved during the uh, fuzzing uh, um, campaign. So there are a couple of uh, interesting connections in, in this particular case to biostatistics. So there's a lot of things that we can use in probability theory, including the coupon collectors problem, but there are also a lot of kind of really nice ideas uh, mm -hmm. like uh, extreme value theory or uh, other kind of theories that we can take from statistics okay. to yeah. estimate these quantities. It's, um, yeah. Definitely an interesting topic. Okay, Marcel, great. Yeah. For the coupon collector's problem, if not, I'm not mistaken, then the expected value should be n log n. Right? If you have n coupons, then with the n log n uh, trials, you should be able to, with high probability, you should be able to get all the n coupons. So, so I guess I'm trying to make a connection of that to the exponential like a claim that you were making, right? So there seems to be a, a bit of a mismatch there. Um, yeah, maybe. I, unfortunately, I don't have the slides. Maybe I, if you want, mm -hmm. if you want, I can pull up the slides and find the slides for uh, this exponential analysis. I, I, oh, I no, give. That, I give that, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll do so the I, paper later. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. But we have a probabilistic analysis of this. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe uh, another follow-up question just uh, regarding this and then, uh, then, uh, uh, then Dominic can ask his question is, is do you, in the analysis, do you model, for example, some bugs are very easy to be found, but some bugs are super hard to be found, right? Yeah. And uh, so, so I guess in, in your analysis, do you try to model such a phenomenon or just assume all the bugs or vulnerabilities are, equally difficult or equally easy to be found? 
So if they were equally easy to be found, then the analysis would be very, very easy. But uh, because they are not equally likely to be found, uh, the analysis is, is very difficult. Like um, we have a, a sum. Uh, so the um, um, so you take the probability of a bug to be found, uh, subtract this from one, take the complement, and take this to the power of the number of trials n, and subtract this from uh, from one again. This gives you um, the probability that this vulnerability um, has not been found. Um, sorry, um, has been found after n generation uh, n gen uh, generated inputs. Because we already subtracted one, um, and this the sum over all vulnerabilities. So you have a sum. Mm -hmm. So you have like yeah, sum one minus one as parentheses is one minus pi, which is the probability of something to be found to the n. Mm -hmm. And that's and because p, that, so that sum is very unwieldy to reason about. If we take pi one over s, the s is the total number of vulnerabilities. This sum collapses to something very simple. And and the this this um, uh, scalability analysis, um, the only statements that I can, that I can really make, apart from this probabilistic explanation that I give in the paper, uh, are all empirical. So they are all just observations. Mm -hmm. Empirical okay. observations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Dominic. Yeah, so um, thanks for the talk. Um, so connected to this cl one claim that you make about an exponential increase in machines leads to only linearly many more bugs. Um, how how could have do we have any idea how we could break this? Like if if for instance um, now fuzzers would get fundamentally better. Do you think? Um, like the data would change in a way that it may be at least uh, maybe quadratic or non like uh, some some super linear increase. Do you think that's possible or is, is so my uh, so I don't think so. Again, it's an empirical law. We don't prove anything, but my, I don't think so. And uh, what you can do is um, you can improve one fuzzer, so we are multiplying this fuzzer across the machines, right? If you incre increase this one fuzzer, the efficiency of this fu one fuzzer a little bit, it, the efficiency will be increased across all the machines. And what you essentially end up doing is uh, changing the slope. This is the exponential number of machines, and this is the number of vulnerabilities found within the time budget. You essentially in, um, change the slope and make it a little bit bigger. That, that's what you can do. I see, thank you. Okay, Shofa, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Matthew, for the nice talk. I have two questions actually. So the first one is also about the the like the exponential cost of fuzzing. I'm wondering, you are uh, like I assume if it is mutation of fuzzers, you probably using the same uh, seed covers for across uh, fuzzing campaigns. Yeah. I'm wondering, would the we um, observe the same phenomenon if we are increasing the initial seeds, the number of initial seeds. Actually, for any um, real world applications, we could easily um, um, gather uh, an infinity number, infinity number of seed covers. I'm wondering if we could uh, um, observe the same like uh, phenomenon if we're gathering, for example, exponentially more uh, seed covers. Uh, so you're modifying, so, so, so do we still have the same setup where you have an exponential number of machines in the same fuzzer, no, but no, each only fuzzer the has... same number of machines. You only so currently the only variable is the number of seeds that you are using. Yeah. Suppose as we enlarge the seed corpus exponentially, what would we observe? Do you have any like experimental experience on that? Um, so. I, I I don't, and I don't think that we see like an exponential increase in number of bugs found or like a linear increase in number of bugs found or something like that. I, I don't have an intuition because, um, but what I can say is that a gearbox fuzzer essentially collects these seeds along the way. Yeah. And um, um, 
So if you increase the number of seeds exponentially, um, so one thing that we have, there's some work uh, which, in, in, so seed corpus is very important, right? As I showed with the mutation fuzzer earlier, you start with bad question mark. Uh, it's very easy to change it to bad exclamation mark. There's some work which investigates the impact of, of, a, of a seed corpus on the fuzzing campaign. And, um, and they find that the impact is a lot, like this intuitive. But my, another observation is, uh, so I've been working with this group from um, Google, which that's called OSS files, which, you know, they look at 500 different open source projects and, um, and they're called Chrome browser. And what they do is they just collect these seeds all the time. Uh, if they change their software, maybe there's some new seed that's found, but what they have is saturated seed corpora. There's nothing you can do to these sort of seed corpora uh, to help increase coverage. So you just like if you in your scenario maybe that maybe the right answer is you'll saturate after very quickly, and you can't do anything to saturated seed corpus other than continue continuing to generate more inputs from this saturated seed corpus and hoping that you then uh, find a, in a very low probability domain something new to cover. Mm -hmm. But they've been collecting these seed corpora over fussing campaigns that are a year, two years long. So. Yeah, because you are saying that your experiment was doing on like uh, the non deterministic fathers. So they are not assuming that the seed uh, corpus has some, like, there is no uh, deterministic way of exploring those seeds. So, I wonder if you're giving it uh, more seeds, for example, you can gathering, continuously gathering um, the, the, like, uh, the valid inputs from, the, for example, internet, then you fit them into the fathers so they can. Like give them more chance to expo expose uh, some of the like uh, program paths that can never be uh, uh, explored using the current seed corpus. That's just a, a random thought. I think I don't know if that. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, guess, I think as you would probably saturate quite quickly. And uh, why I call this a non-deterministic fuzzer is simply I protect against enumeration. Uh, if you enumerate again, you are perfect. You're most effective. It needs to be, I, I, it doesn't, it's not allowed to be um, a white box fuzzer. This only applies to white box fuzzer. So I think it also applies to white box fuzzers in practice, but uh, that I can't say for sure, mm -hmm. for at least to some, because they also use uh, random heuristics. And then, uh, so okay. my statement is about non deterministic fuzzers. Thanks. Maybe I can ask a, a second quick question. So like uh, in our previous discussion, Jindal also mentioned that uh, the fuzzers, no matter it's uh, um, black box or gray box fuzzy, fuzzing, the fuzzers continuously explore or repeatedly explore some, in, uh, some input space or some program space or some program pass. Um, do you think there is a way maybe in the future to mitigate this issue? But because the cost of machines like the majority of the machine uh, resources are uh, like uh, are uh, like uh, they were uh, wasted in this uh, like uh, repetitions. So, do you think there is could be a hope that we can propose some scheme to 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 mitigate this issue? So, I, I think it. So you never. So I, I think you'll never escape the exponential costs, no matter what you do. That's what I think. But what what you can do in practice, you can still minimize synchronization overhead and you can like maximize like what uh Chen Dong suggested the probability that each fuzzer works on something different and uh and therefore kind of um um be like what 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 you what would you do in practice you would probably take a couple of seats and sh and uh, and take give these seeds only to that uh, fuzzer and uh, another another couple of seeds to the other fuzzer. Um, what is the difference between just having one fuzzer having all of these seeds, but being that fuzzer being uh, twice as fast? Right. So. So so I, so my opinion is uh, you can't escape the exponential cost. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your explanation and answer. 
So thanks, Marcel. Let me end just with a one high level question is, do you think uh, we'll be able to build a science of fuzzing, right? Because at the moment, there is just so much work on fuzzing, right? From the security community, from software engineering, and also there's some work in PL and systems. So just uh, sometimes it's hard to measure the progress, right? The community is making. Do you think that we'll be able to somehow one day be able to have a bit of a science of fuzzy? Uh, absolutely. So we should study these foundations a little bit more. So I remember when, um, um, so, so um, when I started fuzzing, most people saw fuzzing like a dark art. It's like uh, you do random stuff to a program and then it crashes and hopefully it crashes. And, and then there's this very smart uh, symbol execution, which does this much more proper, more systematically. And, uh, and, then, and then understanding why this dark thing, this dark, dark art works is like one thing that I try to do build fund a little bit of foundations. And, in, and, and I, I think there's a lot of um, benefit at looking uh, um, at, at something which is understood to be uh, like an art and try to systematize, systematize this a little bit. Um, that's, um, that's one thing. And yes, in order to assess progress in, in the field, we need proper ways of benchmarking um, these techniques that we develop. And there's a lot of work that we can do in benchmarking. Uh, this, um, like, is coverage a proper way of comparing fuzzers? We don't know. Like, how is it, what is, uh, um, how do we benchmark fuzzers? Like, how do we, so we implement techniques. We implement, we, we, we in our papers, we develop techniques, but what we do is we implement tools. And then what we do is we compare these tools across different other tools. Of course, there's a student here that developed a prototype and it didn't do, do a very good job, but the tool is published. And here is a my polished tool. And so I now claim that my technique is better than his or her technique simply by comparing these tools. So is this proper? Can we do, can we kind of lift these, these discussions to the techniques again? And so there's a lot of discussion in bench, fuzzy benchmarking. And also um, one interesting fact is that Google has uh, published this platform called Fuzzbench, which uh, where industry is coming towards us researchers to help us uh, figure these things out and they offer these computational resources. We only need to essentially onboard our fuzzers to their to their uh, fuzz bench platform and then they help us compare uh, these fuzzers. So um, we have um, an upcoming uh, journal special issue where um, we also get Google support. And um, yeah, maybe I can talk about it later. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of work in making these uh, benchmarking, make, making benchmarking proper. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Marcel.